13. The Road to Rome The printing of the English Bible has proved to be by far the mightiest barrier ever reared to repel the advance of popery and to damage all the resources of the papacy. Originally intended for five or six millions who dwelt within the narrow limits of the British islands, it at once formed and fixed their language, till then unsettled, and has since gone with that language to the isles and shores of every sea. Point one. Alexander McClure Attention now turns to the corrupting influence of those sympathetic to the dogmas of Roman Catholicism. By updating the Bible, the modern versions have included within their pages several of the false teachings propagated through Catholicism. Although only covering 13 errors, these false teachings include confession of sins to a priest, Mariolatry, Mary's perpetual virginity and priestly celibacy. Additionally, no longer do the modern versions provide the clear warnings against idol worship, the elevation of tradition, the selling of masses, and repetitious prayers like the rosary. These 13 false teachings align the NIV and the other modern versions with the false teachings of Romanism. I, both teach confession of sins to a man. The relationship of believers one to another is of utmost importance. No matter the effort put into trying to do right and live right, Christians sometimes find these relationships strained and in need of repair. For that reason, the book of James instructs brethren to confess their faults to one another. A person confesses his faults to the injured party, not to some priest who remains powerless to change things. KJB James 5 verse 16 Confess your faults one another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Asking for forgiveness and prayer go hand in hand with the confession of one's faults to another person. The Bible promises that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man has effective outcomes. The New Testament never instructs people to confess sins to another person. The NIV changes the truth giving scriptural support to Rome's heretical teaching of confessing sins to a priest. The Catholic hierarchy effectively uses this teaching to control its followers through the confessional. Neve. James 5 verse 16 Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Christians do not need to divulge their sins to any mere mortal. No man or woman is sufficiently able to listen to someone else's sinful thoughts and actions and remain untainted. Forcing an individual to divulge his or her sins under the threat of condemnation is tantamount to blackmail. The recipient of such filth and some of the most depraved innermost thoughts potentially gains control over the life of the confessor. When the priest grants absolution from the penalty of sin, the individual can feel absolved from his actions no matter how heinous the crime. The Nazi Holocaust and the history of the Italian Mafia offer great examples of what can happen when men feel completely absolved after confessing their sins to a priest. Eventually, their conscience becomes hardened past the point of feeling remorse or the need for confessing to a priest. Sometimes this lack of remorse from confessing sins develops at a very early age, but the results are not evident until adulthood. The Jesuit English Roman Catholic Bible agrees with the NIV. In its explanatory note for the preceding verse, this version states, Ver. 16. Confess your sins one to another. That is, to the priests of the church, whom, Ver. 14, he had ordered to be called for, and brought into the sick, moreover, to confess to persons who had no power to forgive sins, would be useless. Hence the precept here means that we must confess to men whom God hath appointed, and who, by their ordination and jurisdiction, have received the power of remitting sins in his name. Douay Reims, 1610, pages 262 to 263, emphasis mine. This is the very real danger found in changing the Bible. The modern versions continually align themselves with the teachings of those who have historically condemned and persecuted Christians for simply wanting to read the Bible for themselves. The reason that the modern versions read like the Roman Catholic Bible or the Jehovah's Witness Bible is due to the corrupt Greek manuscripts from which they both emanate. Rome does not need to print its own version of the Bible when men like Westcott and Hort incorporated the same heresies taught by Roman Catholicism into their Greek text. See chapter 14- The Men Behind the Madness. This Alexandrian text has contaminated every modern version on the market. In addition to the previous point, the King James Bible, unlike the NIV, identifies the type of prayer that is effective. The true Bible points to effectual, fervent prayer as powerful. 
This would exclude those prayers thrown up to heaven without heart or passion. Once again, the NIV obscures the truth, this time, by concealing the type of prayer most pleasing to God. 2. Both elevate Mary. There are two general types of errors, errors of commission and errors of omission. In the following passage, the NIV commits the error of omission by leaving out the word among when referring to Mary's status. KJB Luke 1 verse 28 And the angel came in unto her, and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. When the reader of the King James Bible realizes that Mary is blessed among women, he understands that she is not blessed above them. Point two, as long as the KJB reigns supreme, the Catholic in search of truth can be shown that Mary was never awarded a place of superiority over other women. Certainly, she was blessed, but God never intended for her to be artificially elevated above other women. Once Christians displace the King James Bible convinced that they cannot understand it, the unscriptural elevation of Mary can be perpetrated upon those unfamiliar with the truth contained in his true word. The NIV obscures the truth by eliminating one word among. Neve. Luke 1 verse 28 The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. The NIV does not convey the simple truth concerning Mary. For those people desiring to elevate Mary to a godlike status, the KJB communicates her humanity too plainly. When a person recognizes Mary's status as simply blessed among women, no longer can she be artificially promoted above other women. Simply put, Mary is not to be elevated, worshipped, or prayed to. She is not all-knowing. She cannot hear the prayers of a billion Catholics, or of even one, because she is not God and the Bible does not indicate or say that she intercedes on others' behalf. Mary was a sinner that needed to bring a sacrifice according to the law. The Bible teaches that only Mary needed purification, not Mary and Joseph or Mary and Jesus. KJB Luke 2 verse 22 And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Mary obediently followed the requirements of the law found in Leviticus 12 verses 2 to 8. The law of God called for a burnt offering and a Sion offering. The priest used these offerings to make atonement for her. The law did not address the woman's husband, yet the NIV redirects the focus away from Mary's sin nature. Neve. Luke 2 verse 22 When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The NIV changes the truth of God into a lie. Read Leviticus for yourself. The NI downplays the fact that Mary was a sinner in need of a sin offering. 3. Both elevate Mary to a co-redemptress level. It is Jesus alone that has the power to save. He purged our sins by himself. Mary had no part in it. The Bible say of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, Hebrews 1 verse 3. Mary was not involved in the work of the cross, nor does she intercede on anyone's behalf. Mary cannot hear anyone's prayers and has nothing to do with the purging of anyone's sin. The Bible proclaims that there are only three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. KJB 1 John 5 verse 7 For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Notice that by defining these three, there leaves no room Mary's equality. The NIV masks this truth by eliminating the majority of the verse and no longer limiting it to the triune God. Neve. 1 John 5 verse 7 For there are three that testify. The NIV makes way for Mary by obscuring this important truth in their Bible. Is it any wonder why Christians fail so miserably when ministering to Catholics? The truth is blurred, eliminated, and distorted when it should be clear as crystal. For Both attempt to teach that Mary had no other children. The Roman Catholic system of teachings began elevating Mary centuries earlier. However, they could not elevate her to a godlike status until they could prove she was no ordinary human being at birth or throughout her entire life. Therefore, they began teaching, among other things, that Mary was supernaturally born without sin, that she never committed sin, and that she never had normal intimate relations with her husband Joseph. The first teaching is called the Immaculate Conception, the last is referred to as her perpetual virginity. Of course, 
This would mean that prayers and has nothing to do with the purging of anyone's sin. The Bible prayers and has nothing to do with the purging of anyone's sin. The Bible proclaims that there are only three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. KJB 1 John 5 verse 7 For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Notice that by defining these three, there leaves no room Mary's equality. The NIV masks this truth by eliminating the majority of the verse and no longer limiting it to the triune God. Neve 1 John 5 verse 7 For there are three that testify. The NIV makes way for Mary by obscuring this important truth in their Bible. Is it any wonder why Christians fail so miserably when ministering to Catholics? The truth is blurred, eliminated, and distorted when it should be clear as crystal. For both attempt to teach that Mary had no other children. The Roman Catholic system of teachings began elevating Mary centuries earlier. However, they could not elevate her to a godlike status until they could prove she was no ordinary human being at birth or throughout her entire life. Therefore, they began teaching, among other things, that Mary was supernaturally born without sin, that she never committed sin, and that she never had normal intimate relations with her husband Joseph. The first teaching is called the Immaculate Conception, the last is referred to as her perpetual virginity. Of course, this would mean that she caused her husband, Joseph, to be a perpetual virgin within the marital relationship and to be unduly tempted by Satan, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5. Many verses from the Word of God plainly prove that these teachings concerning Mary are blatantly false and anti-scriptural. One simple proof concerns the designation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as her firstborn son, KJB. Matthew 1 verse 25 And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. For the Lord to be the firstborn son of Mary, she had to give birth to other boys, too. A first always necessitates a second, etc. The NIV conceals the truth by eliminating the word firstborn. This change eliminates one foolproof text that wholly dispels the false claims concerning Mary's supposed perpetual virginity. Neve. Matthew 1 verse 25 But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Mary had many other children. Not only does the Old Testament foretell that the Lord would have brothers and sisters, but the New Testament confirms this truth. The Old Testament prophecy illustrates that the Lord would not be Mary's only child. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. Psalm 69 verse 8. The context shows this verse in Psalms to be a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, read the next verse found in the same chapter, For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Psalm 69 verse 9 Comparing Psalm 69 with the book of John conclusively proves that Psalm 69 is referring to Jesus. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. 17 And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. John 2 verses 16 to 17. Even the question of the Pharisees concerning Jesus' family members reveals that Mary undeniably had other children. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James, and Hoses, and Simon, and Judas? 56 and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Matthew 13 verses 55 to 56. The NIV makes it much more difficult to show the Catholic the errors taught by Roman Catholicism. The scripture plainly teaches that Mary was not a perpetual virgin, but had a normal healthy relationship with her husband, Hebrews 13 verse 4. Marriage and bearing children is a good thing, not something for those who are less spiritual. V. Both elevate idol worship. Under the law, the Lord gave many rules concerning meats, drinks, and special days. Things changed drastically following the cross and the revelation given to the church. The Apostle Paul wrote that the handwriting of ordinances was nailed to the cross, and no man was to judge another pertaining to Old Testament ordinances. In fact, the book of 1 Timothy offers strict warnings against those who command to abstain from meats, 1 Timothy 4 verses 1 to 3. However, one warning remains intact the warning regarding things sacrificed to idols. KJB 1 Corinthians 10 verse 28 But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that shoot it, and for conscience sake, 
for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Idolatry is very serious matter between God and his creation. The commands against idolatry transcend both testaments. Why then do faithful Catholics have idols everywhere, including their yards, cars, and necks? The hierarchy of this church knows that any rebuke against idols would confuse those who think nothing of putting a statue in their yard, etc. No problem. The NIV removes idols from the word of God, circumventing God's clear admonition against them. NIV 1 Corinthians 10 verse 28 But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience sake. Warning against eating food offered to idols is the whole point of the passage in the word of God, KJB. The NIV conceals this admonition by removing any reference to idol worship in this passage. The book of 2 Samuel offers another warning concerning the dangers of idols or images and commands obedience to God's clear and explicit instructions concerning these idols and images. The graven images of their God shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein, for it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy 7 verse 25. David and his men, knowing the command and the consequences of disobedience, obeyed by burning the images. KJB. 2 Samuel 5 verse 21 And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. God required idols to be burned in order to avoid any possibility of the images contaminating God's chosen nation. Doing any less brought grave danger upon those who were disobedient. In addition to modern version editors, who would not want people to know God's attitude concerning idol worship. Of course, Satan craves stealing worship that rightfully belongs only to God. Luke 4 verses 5 to 8. NIV. 2 Samuel 5 verse 21 The Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. According to the NIV, David and his men did what? In God's word, they unconditionally obeyed by burning the images. In contrast, the pro-Catholic NIV states that they carried them off. No longer can the reader grasp the seriousness of the matter, nor does he recognize the simple act of obedience. If Christians today truly grasped this principle, we would see some book burnings along with CD and DVD burnings. Due to the ungodly influence of the internet and some people's idolization of it with their time and attention, a few computers would end up on the trash heap, too. 6. Both teach that it is blessed to remain unmarried. Historically, a man's normal composition caused him to be more aroused by what he sees than anything else. Therefore, God specifically addresses women to dress modestly, 1 Timothy 2 verse 9, and cautions against women who wear the attire of a harlot, Proverbs 7 verse 10. To help men avoid the pitfalls of lust, women are to dress modestly. Although men are more visually oriented, women generally are excited more by touch. Therefore, God instructs the man accordingly concerning touching a woman. KJB 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1 Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Take note that the Bible does not say that a man cannot ever touch a woman. God gives these instructions in order to help Christians understand how to avoid giving the wrong impression to a woman. The NIV totally eliminates this critical warning and instead adds a perceived credibility to Rome's teaching of celibacy. Neve. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1 Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry. The consequences of the changes to this one verse are threefold. First, the text of the NIV teaches something not necessarily true. God ordained marriage and says that it is honorable, Hebrews 13 verse 4. Due to our innate weaknesses, it is not necessarily good for a man to remain unmarried, and, in many cases, disastrous results are the outcome. Secondly, this comparison should further dispel the myth that the newer versions simply modernized the English without changing the meaning of the text. The gist of the NIV deals with abstaining from marriage while the KJB gives a completely different meaning altogether. Thirdly, the NIV verse justifies the priestly celibacy alleged to be God-ordained by Rome beginning around the 4th century. This dogma is one of the most damnable of heresies due to the consequences suffered by the parishioners at the hands of these unmarried men. The normal God-given sexual desires become abnormal and perverted because of the devilish doctrines. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, 
giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, two speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, three forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. 1 Timothy 4 verses 1 to 3. 7. Both elevate tradition. Roman Catholicism teaches that the traditions handed down from the fathers, those who set policy for Catholics, are equal to scripture. The Apostle Peter warns against elevating tradition, including the traditions established and promoted by their Jewish forefathers. KJB 1 Peter 1 verse 18 For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. The NIV eliminates the Apostle Peter's direct rebuke against tradition. Failing to have these explicit warnings against tradition allows Romanism to elevate tradition to the same level as scripture, and in many cases, tradition over God's word. Neve. 1 Peter 1 verse 18 For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. The NIV eliminates a clear admonition concerning acts that have produced a considerable amount of heresy. 8. Both fail to teach their followers not to pray repetitiously. God wants to hear prayers originating from the heart. In fact, he promises that, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5 verse 16. He does not want us to pray repetitiously, like the repetitive recitation of the Hail Mary. This is vain, empty, worthless, and serves no purpose having been man-made. KJB Matthew 6 verse 7 But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. God wants to hear people speak to him as one would to someone he loves, rather than a canned prayer that has no heart and no thought. The Bible specifically rebukes vain repetitions, unlike the NIV which merely prohibits something as vague and imprecise as babblings. NIV Matthew 6 verse 7 And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. God wants us to pray from the heart not just from the head. He wants to hear Christians pour out their lives and souls before him. The vain, repetitious prayers of the heathen and Catholic alike are conceived by man miserably failing to please God. The rosary prayed by the submissive Catholic is an example of repetitious praying. Unfortunately, it is a repetitive prayer that places the majority of the emphasis upon Mary rather than upon God. This is Mariolatry, the worship of Mary. The Pope has given his full blessing to this type of behavior. Furthermore, Popes never clearly preach the gospel of the grace of God. They do not tell anybody how to be assured of heaven nor do they know if they themselves are going there. A recent Catholic convert to Christ said he went to Catholic Mass with his wife and heard the priest say that he hoped he was going to heaven. What business does this man, the priest, have trying to teach others when he has experienced no spiritual rebirth in his own life? John 3 verse 3, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 8, and has no assurance of salvation? The Lord plainly gave warning concerning the result of the blind leading the blind, Matthew 15 verse 14. They both fall into the ditch. Bible believers need to pray for their Catholic friends, neighbors, and family members. God wants everyone to understand the truth and be saved. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, for who will have all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 verses 3 to 4. We must show them our love and true desire for their spiritual welfare. However, regardless of the depth of our love and concern for them, we must never turn a blind eye toward the error that Catholicism so freely propagates. 9. Both elevate Peter. Roman Catholicism incorrectly teaches that Peter is the rock of Matthew 16 verse 18. Of course, every true student of the Bible knows that the rock mentioned in the passage refers to Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, rather than to Peter himself, that rock was Christ, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4. The Apostle John gives further proof that Peter is not the rock of Matthew chapter 16 when he provides the interpretation of Peter's given name as meaning a stone and not a rock. KJB John 1 verse 42 And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation, a stone. When the Lord says upon this rock I will build my church, he could not have been referring to Peter. 
Peter's name does not even mean rock, and you don't build a foundation upon a stone. Point three, Peter is not the rock upon which the Lord promised to build his church. The NIV hides the true interpretation of Simon Peter's name, thus eliminating the possibility of using this passage to refute the claims made concerning Peter's elevated position by Roman Catholic teachings. Neve, John 1 verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, when translated, is Peter. From reading the NIV, people do not learn that Peter's given name means stone. Once again, the NIV eliminates another text that could be used to help Catholics see the false teachings propagated by tradition. Without the teaching of Peter as the first pope, apostolic succession becomes merely another fabricated concept. Dr. Bill Grady, in his book Final Authority, aptly points out the dilemma with claiming that Peter is the first pope. For Catholics in the know, however, Pope Peter presents quite a paradox. He was so pontifical that he refused to have his toe kissed, Acts 10 verse 26, was so infallible that Jesus called him Satan, Matthew 16 verse 23, was so autocratic that Paul rebuked him to his face, Galatians 2 verse 11, and was so celibate that he had a mother-in-law, Matthew 8 verse 14, point 4. Acts, both condone the selling of masses. A widow during her time of grief remains one of society's most vulnerable creatures. For this reason, the selling of masses is probably one of the most disgusting, despicable Catholic practices because of how it is used to prey upon the weak and elderly. When a husband dies, it is up to the widow how long he spends in purgatory. Within the Catholic system, the widow is forced to buy her husband out of purgatory by spending enormous sums of money or signing her property over to her priest. The book of Matthew clearly rebukes this practice with the most explicit condemnation. KJB Matthew 23 verse 14 Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. It is a historical fact that most wives outlive their husbands. When a Catholic man dies, the priest requires payment from his widow in order to say masses to shorten her husband's stay in purgatory. Especially during the Dark Ages, many of the widows did not have the money to pay for the masses, therefore, they were forced to sign over their houses in order for the priest to receive payment for his prayers, the mass. The scriptures plainly condemn this type of spiritual extortion. The Bible says for a pretense, a false reason like money, these religious leaders make long prayer, like a mass. The Roman system has garnered billions of dollars in assets through this system. Eliminating the opportunity to prey upon those most susceptible would result in a great financial loss to its coffers. Once again, the NIV translators did the devil's bidding by yanking the entire verse from the Bible. No more condemnation of this damnable heresy in the NIV. Neve, Matthew 23 verse 14, Missing for those who may doubt the direct connection to the Roman Catholic system, the context of the whole passage plainly singles them out. Rome is specifically condemned for devouring widows' houses and making long prayer for false reasons. Five verses earlier, those specifically condemned are those who take upon themselves the religious title of father. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Matthew 23 verse 9. These men are calling themselves fathers and, for pretense, making long prayers in order to devour widows' houses. The finger of God could not point any more clearly to the culprits of these despicable acts the Catholic priest and their devilish system. 11. Both elevate the priesthood system. God appointed the Apostle Paul to his somewhat unique ministry to the Gentiles soon after his conversion and led Paul to further reveal it in the Book of Romans. His primary ministry revolved around revealing the gospel of the grace of God to the Gentiles. KJB Romans 15 verse 16 that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. It is important to note here that Paul was not a priest nor did he perform any priestly duty. The Bible student does not find surprising the quick transition from the Old Testament system involving priests and animal sacrifices. Paul knew that the Lord Jesus Christ was the final sacrifice, Hebrews 10 verse 12, and the dissolution of the priestly system. Not so in the NIV. 
Neve. Romans 15 verse 16 to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God, so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Rome elevates the priestly system contrary to scripture, and the NIV translators have been duped into following right along with them, or actually leading the way. Unfortunately, the modern translations will be used to usher in the false teachings of the Antichrist. With so many people clamoring for unity the truth does not stand a chance. The word of God never condones unity at the expense of truth. Every preacher should keep in mind that any attempt to please everyone leaves the Lord very unhappy. Luke 6 verse 26. 12. Both teach self-flagellation. J. Frank Norris was known as the Fighting Parson and the Texas Cyclone. During his day, he was a fierce opponent of communism, Catholicism, liberalism, and evolution. He once said that 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27 is the most feared verse in the Bible. His reasoning was quite simple. He knew that the most fearful thing for a preacher was to lose his effectiveness and future opportunity to preach because sin had overtaken his life. Norris knew that it was the preacher's responsibility to keep his body into subjection. KJB. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27 But I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. J. Frank Norris knew that he had to keep his body in subjection, lest he suffer the ministry-ending consequences of sin. He also knew that the passage did not advocate abusing one's own body. Unfortunately, many people not only abuse their bodies but believe that their abuse will earn them favor with God. Chapter 4 exposes the modern version's heretical teaching of salvation by works. Because the NIV and the Romanism both teach salvation by works, their teachings of abusing one's body to merit favor with God also concur. Neve. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27 No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Monasteries contain thousands of men and women convinced that their abusive antics will somehow gain them favor with God. However, monks and nuns are not the only deluded souls. For instance, many Easter reenactments of the crucifixion take place in predominant Catholic countries by those desiring to physically suffer for the glory of God. They abuse their bodies, convinced that this somehow pleases God. It does no such thing. Galatians contains another verse demonstrating modern version perversion of this self-abuse. Paul wished that those who were troubling the believers were cut off. This cutting off could simply refer to their opportunity to influence or speak to the believers. Their speech could have been cut off. KJB. Galatians 5 verse 12 I would they were even cut off which trouble you. Now read the NIV and see if you arrive at the same conclusion conveyed in the King James Bible. Was Paul hoping that these troublesome people would mutilate themselves? Neve. Galatians 5 verse 12 As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Emasculate means to castrate yourself. Where do you suppose the modern versions get this stuff? It originated in Roman Catholic teachings and men like Origen who castrated himself for God. Origen is the father of all the modern versions, and his influence can be seen when comparing these versions to the truth. 13. Both attack those who disagree with their teachings. As we have seen, the modern versions clearly align themselves with the teachings of Roman Catholicism. One more comparison should further identify the propensity of these modern versions to conceal the actions of the Roman system. Rome's intolerance toward those who reject their dogma is historically apparent. However, if someone rejects the true gospel, should Christians have a personal hatred toward them? The Bible says that the majority of people will reject the true preaching of the cross. Nevertheless, the world's rejection does not justify our hating or destroying those who disagree. The disciples wanted to destroy their critics, but the Lord rebukes them for not understanding their mission and calling. KJB Luke 9 verse 54 And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? 55 But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. 56 For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. The disciples wanted to destroy their critics. Just as the Rome has done to its critics for a thousand years. The Dark Ages was so named because Rome was in control torturing, burning, 
killing, and destroying all those who disagreed with her teachings. Notice how short the same passage becomes when you read it in the NIV. Neve. Luke 9 verse 54 When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? 55 But Jesus turned and rebuked them. 56 And they went to another village. If a modern version is your Bible of choice, you no longer know why the Lord rebuked his disciples. He could have rebuked them because they asked him for permission to destroy their enemies in public. Maybe the Lord rebuked them because he wanted to keep his desires a secret and they were letting the cat out of the bag. See how much truth is missing in these modern perversions? The KJB makes it clear why the Lord rebuked them. They were asking amiss. He had no intentions of burning his critics. He came to save the lost, not to destroy them. The Lord Jesus Christ will not set up his kingdom until sometime following the rapture of the church. No matter how hard the various groups claim to be bringing in the kingdom, it will not happen until after the Lord's return. The Bible tells of a falling away in the last days, 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 5, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, not a spiritual awakening ushering in the kingdom at the height of Christianity. Misunderstanding of this truth has caused much confusion. Jesus said his servants were not fighting to bring in his kingdom. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. John 18 verse 36 Those fighting are wicked, even if they claim to be fighting in the name of the Lord. KJB Matthew 11 verse 12 And from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The NIV changes the entire meaning of the passage with its amillennial renderings. According to the modern versions, and contrary to the truth, those doing the fighting are forcefully advancing Christ's kingdom. Neve. Matthew 11 verse 12 From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. This same false doctrine was used by the Rome to justify the Crusades. During that time, millions were martyred in the name of the Lord. Revelation chapter 17 reveals much about this institution. It describes a city that has ruled the world politically and religiously by martyring Christ's true followers. The Bible describes the location of the spiritual whore. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Revelation 17 verse 9. Rome is called the city of seven hills. It is said of this woman dash the Holy Mother Catholic Church that she is responsible for martyring the true believers of Jesus. KJB Revelation 17 verse 6 And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Revelation chapter 17 points directly toward Rome and its murderous past and wicked future, and someone does not want the world to know. The NIV removes any mention of the martyrs. Neve Revelation 17 verse 6 I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Rome controlled the world system for over a thousand years. They burned, tortured, and destroyed 68 million lives during the Inquisition, AD 1100 to 1800. The reason the explicit details of the Catholic atrocities are not clearly defined in our history books is that the historians have generally skewed or rewritten the facts. History is written with a Catholic slant because the true saints of God were forced to go underground, lest they too become martyrs. Dr. Sam Jipp, in his book An Understandable History of the Bible, succinctly states the truth. The Roman Catholic Church has long been antagonistic to the doctrine of salvation by grace. If salvation is by grace, who needs mass? If salvation is by grace, who needs to fear purgatory? If Jesus Christ is our mediator, who needs the Pope? If the Pope cannot intimidate people into obeying him, how can he force a nation to obey him? The true Bible is the archenemy of the Roman Catholic Church. Rome can only rule over ignorant, fear-filled people. The true Bible turns unlearned and ignorant men into gospel preachers and casts out all fear. 5. New American Standard Version 
As mentioned in chapter 1, any Bible student can trace most of the changes discussed in this book back to the NIV's predecessors. Many times the footnoted points of the earlier Bible versions become the text of future versions as Christians become less acquainted with the flow of the KJB. The NASV in 1960 could not remove the missing NIV verses because the change would be too drastic. We will compare the same 13 heresies found in the NIV, this time using the NASV. Are you to confess your sins or faults? NASV. James 5 verse 16 Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Was Mary blessed among women? NASV. Luke 1 verse 28 And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one the Lord is with you. Was it her purification or their purification? NASV. Luke 2 verse 22 And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Who are the three that bear record? NASV. 1 John 5 verse 7 For there are three that testify. Was Jesus Mary's firstborn? NASV. Matthew 1 verse 25, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Did David burn the idols? NASV. 2 Samuel 5 verse 21, they abandoned their idols there, so David and his men carried them away. Finally, a verse in the NASV that was not changed until the NIV came along. NASV. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1 Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Didn't Peter rebuke tradition? NASV. 1 Peter 1 verse 18 Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. Again, closer than the corrupt NIV. NASV. Matthew 6 verse 7 And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Did you know that Peter's name means stone he is not the rock as claimed by Rome? NASV. John 1 verse 42 He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon the son of John, you shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The verses bracketed by the NASV are completely removed in the more modern versions. NASV Matthew 23 verse 14 Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. The footnote in the New American Standard Version says, This verse not found in the earliest MSS manuscripts. They are referring to the two Catholic manuscripts Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. The first is still located in the Vatican, and the second was stolen by Tischendorf from a Greek Orthodox monastery at M.T. Sinai. Satan's attack grows bolder as Christians become further removed from the true readings found in the KJB. The brackets initially place the verse in doubt. His ultimate goal was to have these verses deleted in there entirely. Was Paul really a priest? NASV. Romans 15 verse 16 To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. One would have to be blind to miss the importance of this change. If Paul was a priest and we are to be followers of him, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, then Baptists and Protestants are wrong and the Roman system is the only one that is right. Priests offer a sacrifice, i.e., the Mass. Discipline in the NASV becomes beat in the NIV. NASV. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27 But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that, after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. The previous verse may not go as far as the NIV, but the next verse far surpasses it. Should we really encourage and condone self-mutilation? The Roman Catholic system does, as do the modern versions. NASV. Galatians 5 verse 12 I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. Bracketed NASV means removed in the NIV. NASV. Luke 9 verse 54 When his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? 55 But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. 56 For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. Rome does not want you to know about the martyrs. 
NASV. Revelation 17 verse 6, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. The New American Standard Version is just another Roman Catholic Bible dressed up in Protestant robes. These changes are not by chance. They are a systematic attack against the truth. Rome wants to hide her wicked ways and practices, and the modern versions assist her in doing so. As already demonstrated, the changes to the modern versions are quite serious and impact critical doctrines. In some cases, the changes constitute heresy. How can so many Catholics and non-Catholics alike be so deceived into accepting such anti-biblical doctrines? Consider a quote from a letter written by Mother Teresa. I am told God lives in me, and yet the reality of darkness and coldness and emptiness is so great that nothing touches my soul. 6. This was written by a woman that the Pope is now considering for sainthood. In late 2003, she was beatified, the third step toward possible sainthood, giving her the title Blessed Teresa of Calcutta. She is not the only one who has impacted the world wearing sheep's clothing. The two men covered in the next chapter are the men most responsible for the changes being made in every modern version on the market today. The reader should seriously consider their testimony. 1. Alexander McClure, Translators Revived, Maranatha Bible Society, Litchfield, Michigan, 1858 edition, pages 71 to 72. 2. The book, From the Mind of God to the Mind of Man, tries to find fault with the King James Bible and its translators over and over again. On page 154, the book lists the holy days found in the 1611 edition of the King James Bible and mentions that some would be unrecognizable by the modern reader. Of course, the two that they would like the reader to especially notice refer to the Blessed Virgin. These days do seem odd to us today, especially because of the unscriptural handling of Mary, i.e., the Virgin Mary, by the Roman Catholic system. It seems that this unscriptural church has caused most of us to miss the mark. Every generation should recognize the blessed position of the lowly woman given the great blessing of having birthed the eternal Son of God. Mary recognizes the blessing bestowed upon her, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden, for, behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, Luke 1 verse 48. Evidently, the churches of centuries earlier were more scriptural than many of us today. They recognized that Mary was blessed. The Bible critic needs to consider his position more carefully rather than trying to attack the one book that has done more good than all the others combined. 3A stone is generally a piece of a rock, usually larger than a grain, but smaller than a boulder. Rock is an aggregate of particles composed of one or more minerals forming the major part of the Earth's crust, igneous rock, metamorphic rock, sedimentary rock. Foundations are built upon a solid rock foundation, not a stone. The same holds true for a spiritual foundation, Matthew 7 verse 5. For Grady, Final Authority, Op. Sit, page 54. 5 Jip, An Understandable History of the Bible, Op. Sit, pages 80 to 81. 6 Newsweek, Perspectives, September 17, 2001, page 23. 14. The Men Behind the Madness. Textual criticism cannot be divorced entirely from theology. No matter how great a Greek scholar a man may be, or no matter how great an authority on the textual evidence, his conclusions must always be open to suspicion if he does not accept the Bible as the very word of God. Point 1 David Otis Fuller Chapter 13 The Road to Rome clearly demonstrates that the modern versions are not a mighty barrier to the advancement of the popery. In fact, they actually strengthen and reinforce the dogmas of Roman Catholicism by incorporating their false teachings into the text of the Bible. How did it all begin? The King James Bible indisputably reigned supreme from the 1600s through the late 1800s without any significant opposition. This period also coincidentally contained the world's greatest period of spiritual revival. However, in May 1881, England published the English Revised Version ESV, selling 2 million copies within four days. Although the ESV failed to gain lasting popular appeal, it opened the floodgates to later versions that would use the same corrupt foundation the Greek texts designed by the Catholic sympathizers Westcott and Hort. Most historians recognize the brutal persecution enacted by Roman Catholicism against all those who have disagreed with them. The most infamous of these was the system of tribunals known as the Inquisition used to torture and kill many of those who challenged Catholic dogma. 
The methods incorporated are notorious and include torture, imprisonment, and murder. Hundreds of books have been written about the brutality of the Inquisition. Amazingly, the Inquisitors kept detailed records documenting their atrocious acts. Dr. Bill Grady, quoting from Fox's Christian Martyrs of the World, gives the following statistics. Torquemada was chief inquisitor until his death, and during the 18 years he ruled the holy office, 10,220 persons were burned alive and 97,322 punished with loss of property or imprisonment numbers so large as to seem incredible, but which are given by Llorente, the Spanish historian of the Inquisition who was well qualified to judge of their accuracy point too. No matter how effective or oppressive Satan's wiles, God always provides a way to stand against them, Ephesians 6 verse 11. The Lord chose one of their own, a converted former Catholic priest named Martin Luther, to enlighten the world. He led Germany and the rest of the world into the Protestant Reformation. The encyclopedia tells us that the name Protestant originated with a group of German princes who protested against the Pope in 1529. The term has come to be applied to those denominations that arose out of the Reformation era, including the Anglican, Lutheran, Methodist, and Presbyterian churches. See footnote for the reason that Baptists are not included in this list of Protestant churches. 4. The Westcott and Hort slash Roman Catholicism Connection Soon after the Reformation began, the papacy began a counter-reformation movement. In 1534, Ignatius de Loyola founded the Jesuits to recapture nations lost to the Protestant Reformation. He also used this Jesuit priest organization to attack, discredit, and remove the Textus Receptus Greek text from use and to support pro-Catholic Greek texts in its place. Eventually, the Jesuits' greatest accomplishment would be to supplant the Textus Receptus, the text used to give us the King James Bible, with the Westcott and Hort Greek text. Their crowning achievement of the 20th century would be the production of a plethora of modern versions. The NIV publisher, John R. Kohlenberger may have said it best when he linked all modern versions back to the Westcott and Hort Greek text. He said, all subsequent versions from the revised version, 1881, to those of the present, have adopted their basic approach and accepted the Westcott and Hort Greek text. Thus, the majority of seminaries have also adopted this corrupt Greek text in lieu of the Greek texts used by the churches for 1,600 years. The historical accounts of corruption emphasize the importance of knowing the men and women behind the modern versions. Those claiming to make the Bible more readable, yet denying the inspiration of the Bible, should have their writings carefully scrutinized to determine their underlying beliefs and motives. Unfortunately, many revisers of the words of God have not even believed in the fundamentals of the faith, let alone the inspiration of the Bible. Two of the men most responsible for the corruptions found in the modern versions are Fenton J.A. Hort and Brooke Foss Westcott. Those influenced by modern textual critics and their criticisms ignore or downplay the heretical beliefs of Westcott and Hort. For example, here is the standard position expressed in a book published in 1999, entitled From the Mind of God to the Mind of Man. But those who really brought the Alexandrian texts to the public's attention were two Church of England clergymen, Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort. In 1881, after some 28 years of careful textual criticism, they published a Greek New Testament that gave primary, though not exclusive, precedence to the older Alexandrian readings. Some have vilified these men's intentions. But what has been amazing to me, as a preacher of God's word who must rely upon the findings of textual critics, is that Westcott and Hort themselves believe that there is actually very little difference between the two major families of manuscripts. Point five. The misinformation concerning these two men is very disturbing and deceptive. This book discusses the changes resulting from the differences between the two major families of manuscripts. No honest Christian would attempt to refute the magnitude of these changes. Westcott and Hort knew the importance of disguising their personal beliefs from public view. Their personal correspondence reveals that they knew the importance of displaying a public persona that looked fundamentally sound. However, it also reveals what they truly believed. Because of their lasting influence, seminaries have become breeding grounds for spiritual infidelity concerning God's words. We need seminaries to preach and teach a dependence upon God and His Word, rather than a dependence upon scholarship and man's wisdom. Who were Westcott and Hort? What were their beliefs? The best way to discover the beliefs of the dead is to study their writings. 
Both Burke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort wrote extensively. Here are some of their beliefs, as revealed by their own writings. Did not believe in the miracles of the Bible. Westcott in 1847, I never read an account of a miracle in the Bible, but I seem instinctively to feel its improbability and discover some one of evidence in the account of it. 6. Did not believe in the infallibility of the scriptures. Westcott to Hort in 1860, I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scripture overwhelming. 7. Hort to Lightfoot in 1860, if you make a decided conviction of the absolute infallibility of the NT practically a sign qua non for cooperation, I fear I could not join you, even if you were willing to forget your fears about the origin of the Gospels. 8. Did not believe in the supernatural creation. Hort to Westcott in 1860, have you read Darwin? How I should like to talk with you about it. In spite of difficulties, I am inclined to think it unanswerable. In any case, it is a treat to read such a book. Hort to Ellerton in 1860, but the book which has most engaged me is Darwin. Whatever may be thought of it, it is a book that one is proud to be contemporary with. I must work out and examine the argument more in detail, but at present my feeling is strong that the theory is unanswerable. 10. Did not believe in the efficacy of the atonement. Hort, the fact is, I do not see how God's justice can be satisfied without every man suffering in his own person the full penalty for his sins. 11. Westcott and Hort were clearly anti-Protestant, pro-Catholic sympathizers. Hort, I think I mentioned to you before Campbell's book on the atonement, which is invaluable as far as it goes, but unluckily he knows nothing except Protestant theology. 12. Believed in the necessity of purgatory. Hort to Ellerton, but the idea of purgation, of cleansing as by fire, seems to me inseparable from what the Bible teaches us of the divine chastisements. 13. Believed in the communist system. Westcott, I suppose I am a communist by nature. 14. Hort, I cannot say that I see much as yet to soften my deep hatred for democracy in all its forms. 15. Hort, I cannot at present see any objection to a limit being placed by the state upon the amount of property which any one person may possess. I would say that the cooperative principle, communism, is a better and a mightier than the competitive principle, free enterprise system. 16. Believed in prayers for the dead. Westcott, we agreed unanimously that we are, as things are now, forbidden to pray for the dead apart from the whole church in our public services. No restriction is placed upon private devotions to pray for the dead. 17. The Roman Catholic system has greatly profited from the money paid for saying Mass for loved ones that have died. Believed in the worship of Mary. Hort, I am very far from pretending to understand completely the ever-renewed vitality of Mariolatry. I have been persuaded for many years that Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common in their causes and their results. 18. Westcott compelled his wife Sarah Louisa to take the name Mary in addition to her given name. Believed in the sacraments, sacrifices. Hort, still we dare not forsake the sacraments, or God will forsake us. 20. Believed in baptismal regeneration. Westcott, by birth he may, if he will, truly live here, by baptism he may, if he will, truly live forever. I do think we have no right to exclaim against the idea of the commencement of a spiritual life, conditionally from baptism, any more than we have to deny the commencement of a moral life from birth. 21. 19. Hort, we maintain baptismal regeneration as the most important of doctrines, the pure Romish view seems to me nearer and more likely to lead to the truth than the evangelical. 22. Acknowledged their heretical positions. Hort to Ellerton, Possibly you have not heard that I have become Harold Brown's examining chaplain. I have only seen him two or three times in my life, not at all intimately, and was amazed when he made the proposal in the kindest terms. I wrote to warn him that I was not safe or traditional in my theology, and that I could not give up association with heretics and such like. 23. Westcott to Lightfoot, it is strange, but all the questionable doctrines which I have ever maintained are in it, a particular book lacking the fundamentals. Dot. 24. Other significant problems with Westcott and Hort. Did not believe in a literal heaven. 25. 
did not believe in the literal second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Point 26. Did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ's literal 1,000 year reign on earth. Point 27. Did not believe in the reality of angels. Point 28. Denied the Trinity's oneness. 29. Doubted the soul's existence apart from the body. 30. Did not believe in a literal devil. Point 31. It is hard to imagine, after reading what these two men believed, how any Christian who espouses fundamental Bible doctrines could align himself with the likes of these two characters. However, every person choosing a modern version over the King James Bible does just that. He aligns himself with two men who despise things that most Christians have held sacred. Their influence can be seen directly in the revision of 1881 and indirectly in every modern version since that time. To ascertain the extent of their influence, read the writings of their contemporaries, including Dean Bergen, another member of the Revision Committee. This is what Dean Bergen said about the New Westcott and Hort Greek text. The history of the New Greek text is briefly this, a majority of the revisers are found to have put themselves into the hands of Westcott and Hort. 32 Dean Bergen knew that the majority of the men involved in bringing about a revision of the Bible were improperly influenced by these two men. The King James Bible New Testament generally comes from the majority text, that is, from those manuscripts agreeing with each other and most prevalent. Unlike the translators of 1611, Westcott and Hort rejected the majority text and relied heavily on the Alexandrian manuscripts which included the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts. One of the members of the committee pointed out that the Vatican Codex is regarded by Hort as a first-rate authority, even when it stands alone, its evidence is regarded as of very high value. When it agrees with some other of certain selected good manuscripts, especially Tischendorf's Sinai Codex, their joint testimony is accepted as almost decisive. Westcott and Hort regarded both the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts as authoritative. Yet, these two manuscripts disagree with each other over 3,000 times in the Gospels alone. 33 These two manuscripts have greatly influenced every modern version on the market today and form the basis for 99% of them. When the majority text of the King James Bible was overruled by majority vote, many of the original 99 revision committee members resigned from the work. Dr. Nuth states that the dropout rate from Hort's overbearing presence was about 88%, with an average attendance of 16, and most of the attending members declining to vote. Point 34. The final outcome was that West Scott and Hort changed the Greek text of the Textus Receptus in 5,337 instances. Hort writing to Westcott on April 12, 1861 clearly shows that they were well aware of the fact that their positions would be viewed as heretical. Also, but this may be cowardice, I have a sort of craving that our text should be cast upon the world before we deal with matters likely to brand us with suspicion. I mean, a text issued by men already known. For what will undoubtedly be treated as dangerous heresy will have great difficulties in finding its way to regions which it might otherwise hope to reach, and whence it would not be easily banished by subsequent alarms. 35. Regardless of the mounting evidence, some so-called institutional scholars remain unconvinced concerning the heretical beliefs of these two men. Yet, Westcott and Hort did not even believe in the inspiration of the original autographs. Writing in their introduction to the New Testament in original Greek, they stated, little is gained by speculating as to the precise point at which such corruption came in. They may be due to the original writings or to his amanuensis if he wrote from dictation, or they may be due to one of the earliest transcribes, 36. These two men are directly responsible for the lack of spiritual backbone in many of today's pulpits resulting from the changes brought about through their corrupt text. Consequently, the modern versions have contributed to the heresies of man. Many of these revisions attack the very fabric of everything Christians hold sacred. Whether you choose the NIV, NKJV, NASV, Living Bible, ESV or any other modern version does not matter. The foundation of each of these modern versions is corrupt. This includes the underlying text of the NKJV when it departs from the Textus Receptus. When differences arise, the NKJV editors chose to follow the false and heretical readings of the Westcott and Hort text. The choice is simple. One must choose to hear the words of God as recorded in the King James Bible and thereby be likened to the man that built his house upon a firm foundation. Therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock.
Matthew 7 verse 24 When the trials of life come, and they will, the only way to withstand the onslaught is to have the right spiritual foundation. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Matthew 7 verse 25 If one chooses to ignore the changes made by these modern perversions, he can be likened to a man who built his house upon sinking sand. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. Matthew 7 26 when the trials of life come, without the right foundation, the destruction is foretold. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Matthew 7 verse 27 Each of us should carefully consider the psalmist's question, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Psalm 11 verse 3 in light of the evidence, only one choice remains. The King James Bible stands alone. All of the modern versions are built upon the same corrupt sinking sand foundation. The Bible says, Blessed is he that readeth. Revelation 1 verse 3. One can be blessed by simply reading the Bible, but it does matter which Bible one chooses. The blessings do not come from picking up one's favorite version. Blessings are derived from reading God's book, and God only wrote one book. 1 David Otis Fuller, which Bible? Grand Rapids, Michigan, Grand Rapids International Publications, 5th edition, 1975, page 157. 2 Grady, Final Authority, Op. Sit, page 192. 3 David Cloud, Way of Life Encyclopedia, Way of Life Literature, Oak Harbor, Washington. 4 J.M. Carroll, the Trail of Blood, Ashland Avenue Baptist Church, Lexington, Kentucky, 1931, page 3. Baptist, Baptists do not trace their heritage to the Protestant Reformation, but back to Jesus Christ and the Apostolic Churches. Baptists are not a byproduct of the Reformation as Curtis Whaley so aptly explained. Though many Baptist groups sprang up during the Protestant Reformation, according to Collier's Encyclopedia, the Baptists have descended from some of the evangelical sects of the preceding age during which the Roman and Orthodox churches dominated all of Europe and suppressed all dissent. A Catholic, Cardinal Hosius, president of the Council of Trent, 1545-1563, wrote during the early years of the Reformation period, were it not that the Baptists have been grievously tormented and cut off with the knife during the past 1200 years, they would swarm in greater numbers than all the reformers. Baptist is named for various groups of Christians who hold certain distinctives such as 1. Salvation by grace through faith, Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9. 3. Eternal security of the believer, Romans 8 verses 35 to 39. 2. Baptism by immersion of believers only, Acts 8 verses 36 to 38. 4. The Bible as the sole authority for the church tradition and other writings are rejected as authoritative, Isaiah 8 verse 20, John 8 verse 47, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, including a rejection of infant baptism. 5. Priesthood of the believer A separate priesthood within the church is rejected, 1 Peter 2 verses 5 to 9, Revelation 1 verses 5 to 6. 6. Regenerate church membership professing Christians, giving evidence of salvation are the only ones qualifying to join the local church, Romans 10 verse 13, Titus 3 verse 5. 7. Autonomy of the local church All hierarchical structures are rejected, Acts 13 verse 1, Colossians 1 verse 2. 5. Williams, From the Mind of God to the Mind of Man, Op. Sit, pages 83 to 84. 6. Arthur Westcott, Life and Letters of Brooke Foss Westcott, Volume I, London, Macmillan and Company, 1903, 52. 7. Ibid, Volume I, 207. 8. Arthur Fenton Hort, Life and Letters of Fenton John Anthony Hort, Volume I, London, Macmillan and Company, 1896, 420. 9. Ibid, Volume I, 414. 10. Ibid, Volume I, 416. 11. Ibid, Volume I, 120. 12 Ibid, Volume I, 322. 13 Ibid, Volume II, 336. 14 Arthur Westcott, Life and Letters of Brooke Foss Westcott, Volume I, London, Macmillan and Company, 1903, 309. 15 Arthur Fenton Hort, Life and Letters of Fenton John Anthony Hort, Volume II, London, Macmillan and Company, 1896, 
34, 16 Ibid, Volume I, 140 to 141, 17 Arthur Westcott, Life and Letters of Brooke Foss Westcott, Volume II, London, Macmillan and Company, 1903, 349, 18 Arthur Fenton Hort, Life and Letters of Fenton John Anthony Hort, Volume II, London, Macmillan and Company, 1896, 49 to 50, 19 Arthur Westcott, Life and Letters of Brooke Foss Westcott, Volume I, London, Macmillan and Company, 1903, 8, 20 Arthur Fenton Hort, Life and Letters of Fenton John Anthony Hort, Volume I, London, Macmillan and Company, 1896, 77, 21 Arthur Westcott, Life and Letters of Brooke Foss Westcott, Volume II, London, Macmillan and Company, 1903, 160, 22 Arthur Fenton Hort, Life and Letters of Fenton John Anthony Hort, Volume I, London, Macmillan and Company, 1896, 76, 23 Ibid, Volume II, 165, 24 Arthur Westcott, Life and Letters of Brooke Foss Westcott, Volume I, London, Macmillan and Company, 1903, 290, 25 Ibid, Volume 2, 49, 26 Benjamin Wilkerson, Our Authorized Bible Vindicated, Tacoma Park, 1930, 197 to 198, 27 Arthur Westcott, Life and Letters of Brooke Foss Westcott, Volume 2, London, Macmillan and Company, 1903, 268, 28 Arthur Fenton Hort, Life and Letters of Fenton John Anthony Hort, Volume I, London, Macmillan and Company, 1896, 219, 29 Ibid, 136, 30 Ibid, Volume 2, 64, 31 Ibid, Volume 1, 121, 32 Bergen, Revision Revised, Op. Sit, Page 40, 33 Grady, Final Authority, Op. Sit, 98, 34 Ibid, Page 25, 35 Arthur Fenton Hort, Life and Letters of Fenton John Anthony Hort, Volume I, London, Macmillan and Company, 1896, 445 36 Westcott and Hort, Introduction to the New Testament in the Original Greek, New York, Harper and Brothers, 1982, Page 280.